stand together. The risen Christ is with us. Amen. Amen. Let's join in worship. You may be seated. Special thanks to the praise band today who's got a little scaled down uh, acoustic set today. Um, keep Angie in your prayers. She gets to be feeling better, but um, it's good to have these folks behind me. Welcome, everybody, to Memorial United. I'm Ron Beaton, one of the pastors. It's a joy to be with you as we celebrate resurrection and the gift of God's grace. Today um, today is also Transfiguration Sunday. We won't be doing too much with that um, today, but this uh, the Sunday we remember when Jesus was transfigured before the disciples um, and uh, just before he entered Jerusalem. And, um, and so that's the Sunday. We always celebrate the Sunday before Lent begins. And so uh, that's, that's today. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to any guest who is with us today. If you are a guest, 
We hope that you'll fill out a connect card in the attendance pad as it gets passed down the row, or you can scan the QR code that's on the bulletin, and that will take you um, to our website where you can fill out a little connect form so we can get to know you a bit better. But we're particularly glad that you're here with us today. Today we're finishing our sermon series, continuing our sermon series, um, Seven, which covers the seven deadly sins. There are seven virtuous remedies. I'm enjoying this. So let's uh, join together in prayer. O oh God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's, Let's stand, stand together, together as we sing, sing our, our next, next song. song.
Let's pray. Come Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire and fill us with your celestial fire. For if you are with us, then nothing else matters. If you are not with us, then nothing else matters. Now as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, may we hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today, which is what Chris will be drawing a little bit from in his sermon, comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. My guess is you'll know this one. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for their iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath. To the Lord your God you shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that through your days may be long in the land of the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
6 through 12 graders would like to go to Sunday school and come from OG to, to the youth basement. So today we are in the second week of our series on the seven deadly sins. It's a Lenten series, but there's not enough Sundays in Lent, so we started a little early. Last week, Ron started us off with pride and gave us an overview of how this list of seven came to be. And uh, we discovered it's not in the Bible, it, it's not in scriptures anywhere that you're going to find, but instead it emerged from desert-dwelling monastics, or people who went to live alone in the desert to become closer to God. And it's been revised over the years and the centuries. Our modern list, if you want to call it that, comes from Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, in the 13th century. So it's been some 800 years since this list has really been uh, revised, but it's where we get it from. And we also discovered that calling them the seven deadly sins is a bit of a misnomer. The more accurate and historical term are the cardinal vices. A cardinal vice or something that's cardinal is something that is so basic to who we are that it's at every level of existence, that every one of us experiences them, even people who are living alone in a desert. And it's not that committing them specifically leads to death more than any other sin, but that because they are this most basic kind, and they lead to all others, that leads to sin and death. So this week, we're talking about envy and its remedy, kindness. Now at its most basic sense, envy is resenting what someone else has. And like last week, there are similar terms that are used interchangeably. Last week it was pride, vanity, vainglory, all kind of get mixed up. This week, envy, coveting from our scripture today, and jealousy often get used interchangeably. And uh, envy is strikingly, strikingly similar to coveting, as in the reading today. But coveting means that you want to take possession of something that someone else has. They have it, you realize that you lack it, and you want it. A book that I read in seminary by David Friedman is called The Nine Commandments. And the reason it was called that as a central argument was that at the root of breaking the first nine commandments is that you want to break the tenth one, you covet. You, you want something someone else has. You don't lie, cheat, and steal unless you want something that you don't currently have. We want something or someone that some other people have, and we can't imagine any other way to get it other than taking it from them. The grass here looks greener on the other side, but rather than taking care of your own grass, you go out and you steal some of theirs. That's coveting. Envy, though, means that you resent that they have it and you don't. It's not even that you want possession of it. It's that you'll do almost anything to take it away from them because you can't have it. It's that grass sure looks greener, so I'm going to go burn their lawn so they can't have green grass. It's not even something like taking your basketball and going home because you don't have one to begin with. So instead you're going around popping everyone else's so they can't play basketball either. But envy also gets confused with jealousy. And that's what I think is the one that gets used more interchangeably in our everyday conversations. But jealousy means that you're afraid of losing what you already have. That's why we have terms like a jealous spouse or jealous boyfriend or girlfriend who's afraid of losing what they already have. They know that they have something good and they don't want to lose it. Right, Ellen? That's why scripture, in our Exodus passage, I ran that by her, by the way. Um, so she was prepared. Um, that's why in our scripture passage today in Exodus, it says that God is a jealous God. Because God has us, God created us in the world, and God doesn't want to lose us. 
So envy, then, is the desire that everyone has it as bad as you do, or at least everyone that you perceive to be on the same level as you. Because we're not really envious of people that we think are way above us on the social or the material wealth ladder. We're not really trying to keep up with the Kardashians. We're not thinking we're going to be like professional athletes or Taylor Swift. Most of us know that the kind of money and life that they have is beyond what we could realistically attain in this life. Sure, we may think about what we would do with all that money and fame and private jets, but it's really just daydreaming. We don't really think that something will attain to. But our neighbor, who lives in a similar house, has a similar lifestyle, similar kind of job, well, they get a new car. And suddenly, we turn that special shade of green. We think, well, if they have a new car, why can't I have a new car? I mean, they're just like me. What makes them so special? Or maybe they, a colleague gets a promotion, or they get a new job that you really wanted, or you think, I, I could do that. Why did they get it? I could do a better job than they're going to do in that. That's envy poking its head up. There was something attainable, and it went to someone else. But as Theodore Roosevelt said, comparison is the thief of joy. Constantly measuring our success and our worth against what others have and do is a recipe for disaster. All that does is helps us focus on our own lack on where we see our own shortcomings. Instead, the virtuous remedy that Rebecca DeYoung, who wrote one of the books Ron and I are using for this series, one of the virtuous remedy that she puts forth is kindness. Because at its root, envy wants to take things away from other people, while kindness seeks to give them something. It's an opposite movement. Now, kindness can give material things like money or food or shelter, but it can also give feelings like hope and joy and a sense of self-worth. Intentional kindness towards others helps to refocus our hearts to doing good and in wanting the best for other people. Rather than comparing what someone else has or doesn't have, we focus instead on what we can do to lift them up. But we have to be careful, because if we're practicing kindness so that other people will see it, then, like many of the virtues, we run the risk of falling into vainglory or pride, like Ron talked about last week. We should practice kindness so that the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Not for the praise and the accolades of look how kind and generous I am to other people, but because it is the right thing to do. This kind of unselfish kindness of watering someone else's grass is what helps to tamp down that inclination toward envy. Because it's also about our sense of identity. We are envious of others because we equate what they have or what they have achieved with value. We think that because their grass is greener, because they have a new car, a new job, whatever it may be, that they are worth more in the eyes of others and maybe even deep down worth more in the eyes of God. And in a materialistic world, that new car of our neighbors means that we begin to feel like we aren't as good, like maybe we've fallen behind. Looking back in my, in my 20s, every time a friend got a new car, whether it was brand new or just a new to them used car, I could see that I started to think about wanting a new one too. Maybe mine's only a couple years old, but you know, they just got a new one, why, why can't I? do that. Like them having that newer car meant that they had achieved something that I couldn't. And I, I trapped myself in that rat race that every, every car salesman's dream. 
But in a sinful and fallen world, you're defined by what you do. You're defined by what you have, by what your job is. That's why one of the first questions we ask people is, what do you do for a living? What's your job? We've come to equate that with our identity. The newest toy or a title or promotion are really what matters. That's why companies will spend $7 million on a 30-second ad this afternoon to show us what we don't have and what we desperately need if we want to be successful people in this world. But in the kingdom of God, who you are is defined by God and God alone. How God looks at you is what matters. And a spoiler here, God doesn't need you to have more or newer things or a better position to love you, to love you any more, or to love you the same as someone else. And someone else having those things of the world doesn't mean that God loves them anymore. Rather, knowing that we are loved by God and that God is jealous for us is what matters. When Aquinas was writing out this list, he distinguishes envy from zeal. At the root, both mean that we know we aren't enough. We recognize we lack something. And we do lack something without the work of God. The difference, though, is that envy wants to bring others down to that level, while zeal wants to make us better and to lift ourselves up, which is only possible through the work of Jesus, not through our own work. So be zealously kind. Seek to better yourself. Seek to spread that kindness to others, but not at the expense of others. Rather, be kind to them and to yourself, knowing that God loves you and God loves them, and that's what really matters. Amen. Now, as we prepare to take up our tithes and offerings, a reminder that here at Memorial you can give in one of three ways. You can text Memorial UMC to 73256. Uh, with Memorial UMC and the amount, you can go to our website and click on the Give tab, or you can put it in the plate as it's passed around. Goodbye. 
As we enter into a time of prayer, as always, I encourage you to take a look at uh, the prayer list each week when it comes out on Wednesdays. Several names on there of folks who are in need of our prayer, and uh, we're a big church, and there's a lot of, a lot of folks um, who could use an extra prayer this week, or a visit, or a phone call. Today, as we enter into this time of prayer, um, uh, there'll be a time for you all to lift up names of those who you would like to pray for. Just maybe say their name aloud or a brief petition of something that you think needs being uh, a prayer. And then we uh, will conclude with, Lord, in your mercy, and you all will say, hear our prayer. So, the Lord be with you. Let's pray together. Most gracious and holy God, your grace is enough. Your love is enough. We pray that we may not give ourselves to envy, but rather give ourselves to your all-sufficient goodness and love. We pray that we may show kindness to others rather than coveting what others may have. See them as people worthy of God's redemptive power, just like us. Help us to live as people who are ready to love you and love others with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love you through acts of worship and devotion, and to love our neighbor through acts of justice and compassion. Today, we often come with heavy hearts, and so now we lift up these names to you. Lord, in your mercy. And now with boldness as your people, we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Let's sing that amen a little louder as we stand and sing our closing hymn. And all the people said amen. As we send you forth from this place, um, I encourage you to take a look at the bulletin uh, for several announcements in the life of the church. I think there's still pancakes um, down there, so if you want to, the Methodist men are serving pancakes um, today, and so I hope you'll go get a little of that. Um, tomorrow is Pub Theology at 7 p.m. at 12 West, so you'll have an opportunity to do that. If you plan to come, it might be helpful just to let Chris know so we have reservations. And then on Wednesday, we kick off the Lenten season with our Ash Wednesday service. It'll be at the, in the sanctuary, along with our friends at the Presbyterian Church, the Christian Church, and the Episcopalian Church. And so uh, it'll be a hootenanny down there as we, as we gather together. It's actually, it'll be a beautiful service, a lot, of, a lot of beautiful music. So I hope you'll be able to be there for that 7 p.m. on Wednesday night. I hear this benediction. God loves you just as much as God can. God loves everyone else just as much as God can. So show them the same kindness that you have been shown, lifting them up and bringing others into that love of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And all the people said amen. Thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the